still owe me a secret. <laughs> all right, listen, there, there is something I haven't told you, right? Yeah? Yeah, but uh, you can't tell Jerry. What do you think, I tell Jerry everything? It's not like he's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the thing is, I, I, I've been living a lie. Just one? I'm living like 20. <laughs> <laughs> What's yours? Well, I... <laughs> I never actually had cancer. But I don't want to be a secondary character. Hello, Ivan. Hello, Stephen. And hello to you, all of our listeners out there in the world. We are But I Don't Want to Be a Secondary Character. We're a Seinfeld podcast out of Melbourne, Australia. Every week we take a episode of Seinfeld and examine the secondary characters from it. And uh, this week we're going to a season six episode, The Scoff Law. That's right, Stephen. Episode 13 of that season. And uh, an episode which I haven't watched for a long time, mate. But uh, I, I don't know. I found it to be a little bit clunky, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it seemed a bit fillerish. Uh, some good, yes. good uh, some good jokes and some good scenes, but uh, a bit inconsistent. Yeah, I was a little bit disappointed, actually. I thought it'd be, you know, I thought it'd be one of those underrated gems in the series, but no, I was, I wasn't too impressed with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we'll talk about where it ranks in a, in uh, the episodes we reviewed so far a bit later. Before we do though, if you want to talk to us about your favorite Seinfeld episodes or anything Seinfeld related or anything even non Seinfeld related, <laughs> that's email it. us. Uh, bidwabasspodcast at gmail.com uh, we're on all forms of social so you can say hello on Twitter Instagram Facebook and Reddit uh, if you want to help us out you can leave a review uh, of this episode or any of our previous episodes on whatever podcast app you choose and uh, if you've got a few bucks to spare you can support us financially as well that's right we are on Patreon PayPal as well as Pod Hero, and uh, on Patreon uh, patreon.com forward slash B-I-D-W-B-A-S-C you can get early access to this episode and you can access our bonus podcasts Curbcast Season 2, as well as uh, Season 11, which is an original Seinfeld podcast where Stephen and I, we write, uh, I guess, episodes of Seinfeld set in the modern era. And, and, you know, there's like plots and secondary characters and story arcs and character development and all that jazz. That's right. We have a crack at being writers. Uh, We... Uh, up to episode three uh, on Patreon. And we do have a season 10 as well, which we recorded about a year and a half ago. And I believe is on our feed. If you scroll down and search around late last year, you'll uh, find all 10 episodes of season 10. And finally, if you want to hang out with us on Facebook, you can check out our Facebook group, Seinfeld Isms. It's now the biggest Seinfeld group on Facebook entirely. So thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. And thank you for uh, <laughs> being a member of uh, Seinfeldisms, if you are one. Yes, if you are, if you do watch Seinfeld. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, thank, If you are a fan. Of Seinfeld. TV, if you actually watch TV, thank you for sure. existing. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yes, indeed. And speaking of Seinfeldisms, my friend, uh, we have a few Seinfeldisms of our own to talk about. So that is the intersection of reality and Seinfeld. And Stephen, I actually have three Seinfeldisms. I think it's a record for me on the show. Your run lately has been a bit dry, so it's good to good to know that you've got a bit of rain, so to speak. So to speak, yeah, it's been uh, uh, what is it, La Nina? Isn't that when it rains? Yeah, it's uh, a, La Nina yeah. has hit the Vandalay Studios and you know washed over me. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're like, nah, <laughs> not keen. Anyway, the Seinfeld isms, my friend. So first one, I got my uh, tires changed on my car and um, they're Bridgestone branded tires, but the name of the actual models of the tires is called Serenity. Oh, so nice. I was going to say, I was going to go to the mechanic and I said, did you just go do Serenity now? <laughs> I was going to well, yell, Serenity what, now. What tires are we putting on the car this week? Serenity now. Serenity now. That's it. Yeah. So I saw that and I'm like, sweet. I actually have tires called Serenity. (laughs) That's pretty cool. Is your car (laughs) driving more peacefully? Oh, much peacefully. Actually, no, it can get a bit angry at times. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you just if you just sort of kick the tires or something, it calms down. That's it. Yeah. Or if you just do like a Kramer and you hold it in and you just calmly say Serenity now, yeah. Serenity now, then and then <laughs> and then it explodes. You know, the engine just blows up. Yeah, like Frank. That's it. Yeah, it just bottles it all in and then just explodes in one big uh, gigantic, <laughs> gigantic seismic explosion. That's right. And then I'll uh, be doing the podcast solo from then on after my funeral. That's right. Anyway, uh, the second Seinfeldism. So my uh, fiance, my wonderful fiance Janina, she made a soup that was featured in the soup nazi and it's actually the soup nazi's signature dish she made mulligatoni oh nice i had a yes. seinfeldism maybe a month or two ago uh, mm, where yeah. i was looking through a cookbook and they had a recipe for it so yeah yeah what so she added chicken like? tastes like well it's kind of like a 
chicken risotto, but it's like an Indian soup. So it's kind of like a chicken curry mixed with a risotto. And it's just because right. it's got rice in it too. So yeah, really, really interesting. Okay. Sounds good. Actually, very tasted hearty. quite nice. Yeah, very hearty with tomatoes and stuff as well. It's good. Yeah, really Probably. hearty. Very perfect for these really cold, you know, locked down Melbourne winters. Yeah, sounds delicious. <laughs> What's your third yes. sign builders? Uh, at Aldi, because uh, I love going to Aldi. Because uh, in Australia, we have uh, Aldi, which is like a German supermarket. And I think they are, of course, prominent in Germany. I think in parts of America too, they have some stores. Basically, yeah. anywhere they speak English, there's Aldi. Interesting there's Aldi, Aldi fact. Yeah. There's two Aldis in, uh, in Germany. There's the blue Aldis. Uh, and then there's the green Aldis, the 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 font of the the logo. And oh. the reason why there's two, I think it's sort of roughly north and south Germany. My son who lives in Germany, his mother told me this, and I was very enthralled by Aldi sort of culture of Germany, I guess. But the brothers way back in the day, the Aldi brothers had a big falling out, but right. they were practical and typically German enough to go, well, even though our, our relationship is is severed, we'll keep the business afloat and we'll agree to take different parts of Germany and you brand yours blue, I'll brand mine green, and then we'll huh. we'll, do, we'll conduct business separately under the one brand name and uh, we'll all be happy. So there you go. So one of the brothers decided to come to Australia. We got the blue one. I wonder yeah, when the green one's going to rock up. Well, the green one <laughs> is in uh, Queensland. Oh, there's actually one in Queensland for real in so, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay. If you are in, in Queensland and you live near that green Audi, send us a photo. I'd be really curious. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Anyway, what I was saying was um, because over the 4th of July, they have like an America sale. So they have like all the American candies and soft drinks or sodas and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I got Junior Mints, of course. Every time uh, Audi has a sale, I get a couple of packs of Junior Mints. Nice. So, yeah. That was actually one of my sign builders. I was in Audi <laughs> oh, sweet. on the weekend as well. Ah, oh, there you go. And you got them too. Uh, I didn't get them, but I saw them. Oh, you saw them. Okay, cool, cool. I was going to say, you don't eat them, but at least I thought maybe you could keep the box. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe if you eat them and i'll keep one of your boxes there you go oh yeah sounds good yeah come over well after the lockdown in melbourne come over and um, we can do that <laughs> so i've got uh, a large amount of seinfeldisms as well i'm going to start um with probably the best seinfeldism that's ever happened to well us really uh which is we so just a bit of background my uh sister celebrated her 40th birthday um over the weekend and her brother i'm uh, sorry my brother-in-law her husband got her a personalized shout out from larry thomas he's the actor who plays um yev kasim who's the yes. soup nazi and uh he sent her a personalized message and he sort of did his soup nazi character wished her a happy birthday it was all very lovely in his message uh he also gave a shout out to us which was really really cool yeah that's right yeah it was really really cool a Seinfeld podcast from, and I love how he tried saying Australia. Yeah, it was kind of a Ocker Australian soup Nazi <laughs> combination. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Pretty so good. my, my yeah. brother-in-law, he obviously, I'm, I'm get, I haven't actually spoken to him, but I'm assuming he mentioned that, you know, his brother-in-law being me uh, does mm. a Seinfeld podcast and uh, Larry was kind enough to give us a bit of a shout out in the message. And uh, yeah. That's my, uh, we've peaked. I've peaked when I saw that. Yeah, we like, peaked. I'm like, there's, yep. I don't need to do anything more in life. I can, I can leave life with a, with a smile on my face. There's, there's nothing more I need to do. My work here is. Yeah, yeah. that's it. This, this is the final episode of Bidwabar. So thank you so much for the many years of support and uh, you can still support us financially and we're out. See you later. Yeah, we're, done. we're done. We're done. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, no, uh, of course, we're still around for at least 30 something more episodes. Yeah. You're still stuck with us for a little while yet. <laughs> you poor buggers. <laughs> Yeah, my third Seinfeldism. Uh, I was watching Friends last night. I generally avoid watching Friends, but I spent most of the day exercising yesterday and I was buggered sitting on the couch and I couldn't be bothered. Changing the channel seemed like to, uh, too much of a task. So I uh, was stuck watching Friends and uh, the actor Larry Hankin, who plays Kramer inside of uh, Seinfeld in the pilot, he made an appearance on Friends. So that was pretty oh, cool. Oh, excellent. Did yeah. he steal raisins too? <laughs> no, no, no. But he actually <laughs> plays a sort of maladjusted... Uh, grump like he does uh, in Seinfeld. So no. I think that's that's the stereotype that he uh, acts to. There you go. Well, he actually, I think we did mention in the episode, The Pilot, We, um, I think we mentioned that he actually auditioned for the role of Kramer back uh, before the Seinfeld Chronicles came out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Kessler, yeah. So yeah. He would have been perfect. <laughs> if yeah, Michael I, Richards somehow didn't, you know, want to do it or whatever, he would have been pretty good. Yeah, I think he would have, uh, he would have carried the weird part of Kramer through pretty well, but I don't think he would have been uh, kooky or eccentric enough, you know, and like, no. sort of live. Um, yeah, he would have made different choices. Yeah, for sure. My fourth Seinfeldism is uh, I was I went for a bike ride last night um, and I rode past a cafe and uh, this was in Carlton, I think, or Fitzroy North. I can't remember the name of the cafe. And there are pictures of Jerry, Elaine and Kramer. 
uh, on the outside of the cafe. I think it's like a 90s themed cafe or something because they've got pictures oh. of Friends and Seinfeld nice. um, and maybe Dookie Hauser or some other 90s comedy or sitcom. On <laughs> Did the they call it Central Perk Cafe? <laughs> like in yeah. Friends? No? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's many cafes around the world called Central Perk. <laughs> called Central Perk, maybe. Capitalizing on the 90s nostalgia. Nostalgia, that's it. <laughs> nice, Central, nice. Central Monks. The Central Monks, yeah, that's it. It's like a Friends Seinfeld combo bar cafe. Yeah, just, just 90s in a cafe. 90s in uh, a cafe, yeah. Game Boys, Nintendos, every, you know, 64s, <laughs> everything. Yeah. It's all there. Urkel, yeah. Golf yeah, War. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> nice, just, nice. Just to, just to darken it up a bit. My that's fifth it. <laughs> and final Seinfeldism, I was listening to a <laughs> yeah. podcast this afternoon, actually, and it was quite a, I guess, a heavy or a dense podcast that were talking about, um, I guess, current left-wing culture, let's say. And uh, they were talking about, um, I guess, the modern history of left-wing uh, youth cultural political activism. Uh, and they use Seinfeld as an example of sort of peak multiculturalism of the 90s. And they were talking about how the core four kind of represented just a, a broad set of what people understand now as white people. You know, George is kind of Jewish-ish, <laughs> Jerry is Jewish. Um, yeah. You know, they've all got various ethnic backgrounds, but they're all just sort of lumped in as white people and Seinfeld was sort of a representation of that or a proxy for that idea of oh. you know multiculturalism being peak in the 90s and I thought that was an interesting comparison because I'd never really thought of Seinfeld um, as that <laughs> but I, I think they made a good yeah. point. Yeah I would never have associated multiculturalism with Seinfeld but there you go. <laughs> Not so much multiculturalism just various cultures representing you know the sort of the uni identity of what is white. Yeah sure okay yeah. cool so, <laughs> sounds very okay. left-wing. <laughs> yeah a bit, a, a, a bit of an intellectual Seinfeld for you. <laughs> intellectual Seinfeld. Seinfeld. <laughs> cool. That's all your Seinfeldisms, eh? That's it. Five for me, three for you, eight. I think My that's God, by eight. far and away the most Seinfeldisms we've ever had. And if most of you have already tuned down, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, to, to balance out the heavy uh, Seinfeldisms, there's no Seinfeld news. So there you go. Okay. No Seinfeld news this week. There you go. Well, that's a huge, a huge balance in favor of Seinfeldisms. That's right. Anyway, let's have a quick break, my man. And when we come back, we are talking about the secondary characters from episode or season six, this is rather, uh, episode, the Scoff Law, episode 13 of that series. I've got notes today on Gary Fogel. John Lovitz's character, um, as well as Officer Morgan, Debbie, and the guy with glasses. Do you have notes on any other characters? Uh, yeah, so I've got notes on uh, Jake Jamel, Debbie, Officer Morgan. Um, I've got one or two on Mr. Lippman because he does appear in one scene, and the salesman who is trying to sell George the toupee. That's it. Anyway, let's have a quick break and we'll come back and talk about him. Hi, this is Zach and Aaron from Seinfeld Law, and uh, you are listening to But I Don't Want to Be a Secondary Character. The Scoff Law is Season 6, Episode 13, and it first aired in the US on January 26th, 1995, directed by Andy Ackman, written by Peter Melman. In this episode, when George learns that their friend Gary, played by John Lovitz, never had cancer as he claimed, he promises to keep it a secret from Jerry. Of course, George can keep a secret for about two seconds. Elaine gets all tied up in knots when she learns that someone said hi to her ex-boyfriend on, beha on her behalf, Jake Jarmel, played by Marty Rackham, in his final appearance on the show. She goes out of her way to let him know otherwise which seems to defeat the purpose of it all. Kramer has a run-in with the local beat cop, Officer Morgan, played by Ivory Ocean, who tells him that there's someone in the neighbourhood who has amassed parking tickets for years. A spoiler alert, that is Newman. And Kramer figures out who that just might be. So other secondary characters, of course, uh, Richard Fancy plays Mr. Lippman, Barbara Allen Woods plays Debbie, uh, Lillian Lehman plays the judge, Danny Breen plays the guy with the glasses that sells Elaine his glasses from Malaysia, Basil Hoffman plays the toupee salesman, Bob Shaw plays the cabbie in another appearance on the show and elizabeth solely she plays the woman at monks yeah lots of secondary characters yes it's very dense in secondaries in this episode anyway a bit of trivia about the episode my friend did you know that when george walks into monks and asks the beautiful woman how's your life all right uh, that's something that jerry actually overheard keith richards from the rolling stones say and he added that into the script i love that scene it's my favorite scene in the whole uh, episode where george yeah. walks in and is just you know cock of the walk comes <laughs> up and he knocks on the knocks on the uh on the uh, the counter, and he just yes. sitting there cocky as hell, and that that woman is just very impressed with him. And then he, yeah, she's so impressed that she pulls out a chair for him. Yeah, she kicks out a chair for him, and he just yeah. uh, he's just like, yep, this toupee was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Yes. <laughs> I've got a few trivia notes as well. So uh, in the scene where Jerry tells Kramer that he looks like a pirate, Kramer's response is, I want to be a pirate, which is mm -hmm. a reference to episode two of season five, the puffy shirt, and also the inspiration for our logo and our name, uh, where, <laughs> yes. where Jerry says uh, that he doesn't want to be a pirate uh, in his much known whiny boy. 
voice. I don't want to be a pirate. Yes, whereas uh, Kramer wants to be a pirate. Yeah, and I think that's a uh, a good little representation of their attitudes. You know, Kramer's happy to do pretty much anything, especially when it comes to supporting people. Uh, and Jerry is very selfish and doesn't want to do it. So I thought, that, yeah, very, that yeah, very selfish. If it doesn't affect his image, I mean, if it affects his image, then he's selfish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I thought that was a nice <laughs> little representation of their differences and uh, a nice touch as well. And uh, you're probably wondering if you watch this episode, why does the uh, officer Morgan actually have a uh, an eye patch? Turns out in a deleted scene, he explains to Kramer that he has a sty in his eye, uh, but unfortunately that part was cut due to time. Uh, okay. Mm, yeah. It's a good way to set up Kramer just having an eye patch because his, his image has become stagnant as he says yeah stagnant that's it and um the story of a man with an eye patch pursuing a white whale in this case newman the scoff law it's actually a nod to the uh book moby dick yeah i think that's where the term white whale to describe you know a big target or something that you really want to acquire <laughs> that's bigger than life itself i think that's where it actually comes from and newman is white and uh he was well wayne knight was quite large at the time so it was very apt <laughs> yeah that's true it works, on both, <laughs> works on both levels george in his uh, usual contradictory way says that he's clearly aware to jerry of the concept that you have to tell your wife uh, everything however uh, a bit later on uh in the series in season uh seven episode nine the sponge he tells sozin that he's never actually heard of the concept before so when no, it suits him, he, yeah. He's uh, he's aware of it, but uh, when he has to betray his own <laughs> um, privacy, he uh, conveniently forgets about it. Of course, uh, that is George. He tries. His life is basically like he says. He lives twenty lies. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, for he, it's whatever suits him. He, he changes accordingly. He is a uh, a opportunistic. Uh, what's the lizard called? A chameleon. A chameleon. And speaking of chameleons, probably a lower comedian than George. Oh, let's talk about Gary Fogel, huh? Yeah. He's uh, played by actor and comedian John Lovitz. Of course, he is a Saturday Night Live alumni. It's his most famous role. He was nominated for two primetime Emmys for his performances on the show. He has been on the show from the 1980s and the 1990s and also appeared in a 2020 episode of Saturday Night Live. Uh, his other work includes films Happiness, A League of Their Own, and Loaded Weapon 1. It is a parody film uh, of Lethal Weapon. And uh, for TV, he's most famous for voicing Jay Sherman in the animated TV show The Critic, and he's appeared in The Larry Sanders Show and News Radio. So, yeah, Gary Fogel, he is um, obviously quite prominent in this episode, but we find out in The Face Painter that he actually died in a car crash because he accidentally tried to adjust his toupee. Yeah, I forgot about that. But um, yeah. I, do, I do remember that now. You've mentioned it. When we talked about it, yeah, when we did that, uh, the Face Painter episode, yeah. But what I was saying was with, uh, with Gary Fogel, I mean, he... I think he's actually worse than George because at least with George, like he makes lots of lies, but lots of them are like white lies or they might be things which uh, I guess are a bit, can be seen as a bit dismissive. Whereas Gary Fogel, he lies about having cancer and going through chemo. And even George, he he takes a step back and says, even he wouldn't lie about that. So I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty low. Yeah, no, he's definitely a scumbag. Um, and the fact that he's just so, I think what makes it more scummy is the fact that he's just so flippant about it. He doesn't really feel guilty or, or think that it's something he needs to to admit to people that he's lied to or, or atone yeah. for. Um, you know, yeah. when he uh, when he admits to George that he didn't really have cancer, he kind of just laughs it off and says, okay, see ya, and walks out. And George is obviously shocked. So I think the fact that he has no remorse adds to the scumminess. Yeah, absolutely. And and for someone like me who has gone through cancer, like it kind of rubs me the wrong way, you know, when you see, because uh, there's this uh, there's this Australian woman named Belle, I think Belle Gibson, her name is. She was like this blogger who faked having cancer. And, um, you know, she put up like treatments of stuff. And, you know, it was found like she was lying about having treatments done and stuff. And uh, she got sued for like i think she got sued for fraud or she got charged or something i'm not too sure of the details but yeah just those real those real scumbags you know who lie about shit like that they really rub me the wrong way especially as i'm a survivor <laughs> so even though gary is fictional of course i don't know he just he just kind of rubbed me the wrong way even george well, and jerry thought it was fucked well he unfortunately represents you know people like bill gibson and other people who do that so even though gary is fictional there are certainly people uh, lots of people who do it in real life so i can understand yeah. why you'd be uh, pissed <laughs> off and why it would rub you the wrong way specifically because of your you know, because you've had cancer. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but I guess for me, I, I guess the reason why he probably does all this stuff is I think he's probably has really low self-esteem. He wants mm -hmm. people to kind of feel sorry for him. He probably didn't ever got the attention that he thought he deserved in his younger years, especially like, for example, with her, with uh, Debbie, who we'll talk about a bit later, um, him and George's childhood friend. You know, Debbie, he told George that Debbie liked George, 
But then George finds out through Debbie that Debbie actually is in love with Gary, not for his looks or his personality, but more of like his supposed, you know, perseverance in fighting cancer. So, yeah, I mean, he just, he probably just thought that he thinks that the world owes him and he, he does everything, you know, to try and get attention. Yeah, I, I kind of see him as a more unfortunate George. I mean, George is known to be kind of the loser of the core four, but mm. on paper, he's still, you know, for a quote unquote loser, he's still relatively successful in, uh, in, you know, in life. Like he's got some good friends around him, even though they all treat him like shit. He's not <laughs> a, a loner. He is unemployed a lot of the time, but he has worked some pretty like high profile jobs. He's worked for the Yankees. Um, yeah. He tends to uh, be pretty successful with women. So even though he's seen as a loser, he has a lot of success mixed in as well. I think mm. Gary is a loser. Uh, in the traditional sense of the word without that success that happens to George from time to time. So I think that contributes to his lower self-esteem than, say, George using him as a comparison and therefore his higher amount of scumminess. He's sort of like George without the occasional success and a bit more scumminess added to him. Yeah, I mean, he's a perpetual loser. He's kind of like, I guess if you look at The Simpsons, he's like the character Frank Grimes. But at least with Frank Grimes, you know how he's just a perpetual loser. At least he tries. I think with Gary, like he's just a perpetual or lose when he probably doesn't even make the effort you know he just probably yeah. just no, he, nothing you know he never looks for opportunities and you know so I think it's it's more like that yeah I could imagine someone like Gary maybe he did try to be you know successful in the traditional sense and nothing worked out for him you know he was never able to have a relationship he was never able to be successful in his career everything he tried failed he probably just got to a point where he's like what's the point in trying mm. you know to get what I want I try and fail so I'm just going to cheat you know it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the path of least resistance yeah and he's going to go obviously in order to do that he thinks or he's thinking of like what's something which i can say that that's happened which people will feel sorry for me for and probably won't even question me about and it's like oh cancer there you go i had chemotherapy you know and if someone says oh you're lying it's you know they look really insensitive so yeah, well, uh, yeah he mean, thought that would shield him from uh, persecution until george and jerry catch wind of it well he didn't yeah i mean he didn't like just invent the cancer diagnosis he just didn't correct the doctor's mistake you know he let people believe that the doctor's misdiagnosis was actually true um, yeah that's right is, you know, it, I mean, that's semantics, but it's, uh, you know, it's a slight difference. He didn't just sort of create, like he didn't do a Bell Gibson where he just made it up out of the blue. He just sort of. No, that's true. That's true. He, he ran with the misdiagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't clarify yeah. the, the mistake the doctor made. But um, I and mean. And how you know, weird, he, like one thing that, that was really, sorry, Steve, one, one thing that was really weird, I found that when George said that Gary told him that he had the surgery and then they found he didn't have cancer. So they actually opened the guy up and found out he didn't have it. That's a bit odd. Mm, Don't yeah. they have x-rays and MRIs and stuff? You know, yeah, you see I it. Mean, that's a, that's, that seems like a pretty severe misdiagnosis and uh, oh, a, yeah. pretty, a pretty drastic way to find out that uh, you don't have cancer, you, you know, after surgery. Yeah, I mean, surely there's some like legal grounds to sue, you know, like surely there's like mal, a malpractice lawsuit there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know much geez. about that sort of stuff, but uh, <laughs> that sounds, uh, you know, that sounds potentially true. Yeah. Sorry, I, I interrupt you before what we're saying. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I was just going to comment on how much confidence the toupee gives him, but I think mm. it's sort of like confidence i think it's more of a narcissism than a genuine boost of real self-esteem i think it's yeah. my case well this i am the toupee it's almost you know he is it's it's a new part of his identity rather than just something that makes him feel a bit better about himself he is one with the toupee i think so yeah because i mean it yeah. completely transforms him it turns him in, even though it turns him into an arrogant dick you know he's very um belittling to jerry about his feelings and he just sort of gets way too cocky you know and just sort of becomes a douchebag basically yeah I, I think he because he if we're going along with the theory that he doesn't have much going on in his life in the way of success a little bit of confidence from a toupee just completely overturns that low self-esteem and, and gives him too much self-esteem you know it's yeah. from one one end of the spectrum to the other <laughs> to the other and that gave him the confidence to go up to the lady at monks but i think i don't think the lady at monks was interested in him for his personality i think he was probably using the cancer line and the cancer story and then she probably yeah. felt really sorry for him and thought oh look you know he's gone through a lot of shit maybe i'll give him a chance maybe we'll go on a date see what happens yeah there, there is uh, a sympathy card that is played a lot Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, but that's exposed when when uh, Jerry tells him that he knows that he's lying, which uh, I love <laughs> that scene it. as well. I love when when Jerry looks at George and shrugs, like you know, come yeah. on, can I, can I let him know that I know? And George, and then Jerry like, shuts the door. <laughs> yeah, so and then good. George. 
<laughs> yeah, George looking in the mirror back at Jerry just goes, yeah, you can. You can yeah, do it, do it. <laughs> yeah, he would have got a huge grilling. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I had a theory as well about the parking space. I don't think that that was a real offer. No. Or I don't think I, it was a real parking space because it ended up being uh, used for Newman's car. But I don't think Gary was in a position to offer it as freely and uh, casually as he did to George. He was probably aware of a vacant parking space, but I think he kind of just not, not lied, but sort of exaggerated his ability to give that to George. Um, yeah, you know, and that and that basically reinforces the idea that he's more of a shitty bloke than George. Well, at yeah. least with George, he's li- like he's he's yeah, you're right. He's been a loser, but he you know he's been successful in terms of work and dating beautiful women and being yeah, engaged. Mix, and, George, George is a mix of of loser and success. You know, sometimes yeah. he's a loser, sometimes he's a success. Whereas Gary yeah. is mostly a loser with yeah. maybe rare moments of success, but none that yeah. we're aware of. Yeah, exactly. But George but, even has yeah. limits too. Like he you know La- Gary says you know I'm, I've been lying, and then George. Like I've lived twenty lies, you know, yeah. or something along those lines. With George and 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 Gary, I think it's more quality over quantity. I think mm. with Gary, like he doesn't he doesn't lie as often, but the lies that he do are really really bad. At least with yeah. George, he does like little white lies here and there about yeah. different things, but you know they, uh, they don't all add up to like one thing. George mm. has white lies, and Gary has a white whale of a lie. Yeah, yeah, that's, he's a white whale of lies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but definitely. Regardless of which way you slice it or whatever the reason, definitely just a scumbag. Um, yeah, yeah, he is. To lead people on or to not correct a misdiagnosis and uh, let people and, and close friends as well, you know, and probably family, probably, you know, everyone important in his life. He went along with it because he got so much sympathy. And, you know, he probably also, well, he definitely did it for the gifts as well. I mean, Jerry's pissed off that he, you know, he got him a gift of a voucher at the, the hair clinic under false pretenses. So, yeah, definitely just total scumbag move. 10 out of 10 scumbag yeah. move. 10 out of 10 scumbag, yeah, definitely. And and if he was around in 2020, he'd probably write a blog about his fake cancer, you know, <laughs> and uh, he'd probably try hocking, hocking some therapeutic treatments, which don't work. He's a, he's a classic grifter. <laughs> Classic grifter he is indeed. Um, but yeah, no, I liked I liked John Lovett's performance. Like I hated the character, but I liked John Lovett's performance. Uh, I, way to I, go, I, Jack. Way to go, Jack. <laughs> way to yeah, go, I, Jack. I automatically like anything John Lovett's does because I think he's yeah. brilliant. I love his voice. He's always so sarcastic. Got yes. such a great right wit. The Critic, which you mentioned before, it's one of the most underrated TV shows, you know, sitcom cartoon whatever ever. yeah it's an amazing definitely. show if you haven't checked it out it's fantastic yeah uh, have to. yeah yeah I, I love anything john lovitz does so yeah loved him <laughs> hated the character i love lovitz yes <laughs> we do. Did you have anything else about Gary? No, I don't. But uh, let's talk about Jake Jamel, Elaine's episode ex-boyfriend. Yes, that's right. Jake Jamel, he was played by Marty Rackham, and it's his final appearance on the show. He's uh, He appeared in other episodes. Uh, he's appeared in... Actually, he's played two characters. He played the cop or one of the cops in the trip in part two. He's actually like one of the guys who takes um, Jerry and George to the station. And yep. uh, yeah, he's appeared as Jake Jamel in three other episodes of the show. Nice. So uh, yeah, Jake Jamel. Mel, I mean, obviously it's been a while since, I think it's like probably half a season or so since uh, Jake and Elaine broke up. I think they last saw each other in the Sniffing Accountant, I think in season five was the last one he was in uh, when you know, with the exclamation point. And uh, yeah, Jake, he's gone on to become a successful writer. Obviously, that's probably how Jake and Elaine met, you know, from the writing. Oh, actually, no, sorry. The last time they met was uh, when Elaine got Juju Fruits. Uh, that's when they broke yeah. up. Yeah, 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 that's right. Sorry, that, that was that, that, that episode. Yeah, that's it. But obviously, they're both writers and that's probably how they, you know, felt and how they, you know, I guess, fell in love with each other or like each other but yeah jake's gone on to become a best-selling author yeah i think the the glasses that he's very protective of or at least the origins of the glasses i think he when he you know he was in malaysia on holidays or maybe as part of his press tour or something uh and he found those glasses he liked them enough to i think he saw them as well now i'm a successful author i'm going to be in the public eye a lot more i'm going to become you know maybe a, a minor or even major celebrity uh these glasses are sort of my new image you know that I, I don't think it was just i personally like these glasses i I think they I think they made him feel like uh, more of like a serious author in the public's eye. You know, they were like a, mm. almost like a prop for his new, you know, soon to be famous sort of profile. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And it's funny how there's like a reference to Star Trek as well. Did you notice that the books behind him was like an autobiography from William Shatner? about Star Trek. Uh, no, I yeah, didn't. Yeah, that, that was a really nice touch. I nice little nod to Star Trek. Oh, okay. No, I didn't notice that. I do like at the book signing when uh, Elaine comes up to him to sort of take back the high and that guy's behind her in the line frustrated and he's like, you know, I've been waiting here all day to get my book signed and Elaine just takes his book and signs her name and gives it back to him. <laughs> Even though that's not yeah. about Jake, I just love that. Elaine's just like, you know, here's your signature. Like, fuck off. Like, you know, I'm, I've got Jake's <laughs> attention. Yeah, that's it. 
<laughs> Lovely. Jake, I find to be, he's, he's quite cocky. Look, I honestly yeah. can't recall what he's like in previous episodes. I've, I've got snippets, but I can't remember his character uh, as a whole. But he's actually quite like sort of cocky and a bit almost, well, like Elaine says, he's quite smug. And I think he, I think he's just developed that because his book is now a success, you know, like he's, he's achieved his dreams and, uh, you know, it's given him a boost of confidence. Yeah, absolutely. He's become, uh, you know, the, the uh, fame has kind of gotten to his head. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think he's so self-absorbed, though, that that wouldn't sort of uh, dissipate over time. I think eventually, you know, after the success of this book and, you know, if he got more success after writing his next book, he would be a bit more humble. But it's just that initial injection of success that gives you a bit of an ego boost. And I think that's shown in this episode. Yeah. Do you uh, have anything else about Jake? No, but uh, you can uh, f- listen to f- uh, previous episodes where he's been in and, uh, yeah, we have uh, talk about him in the context of those episodes too. That's right. All right, let's move on and uh, talk about a third secondary character. Uh, let's talk about Officer Morgan. Officer Morgan, yes. He is played by Ivory Ocean. He's known for the films The Mask and Lost Highway, and uh, he passed away in 2011, aged 65. And uh, this guy, he's definitely a New York you know, NYPD beat cop. He's been, you know... He's been around in NYC on the uh, on the beat for many many years, and he's basically seen it all. Yeah, well, I mean, he says that he's been trying to catch what is you know after he first appears, what is soon to be revealed as Newman for sixteen years. So he's been at least a cop on the street for sixteen years, probably more than that. I would say that his age is around forty forty five. I would yep. assume that maybe he left high school and you know joined the academy. I think he's a career cop. Mm-hmm, he's got that he kind of like surly, jaded New York cop cliche vibe of you know i've seen it all of nothing shocks me you know i'm jaded and he's just sort of like almost not grizzled but just sort of like he's been through a lot he's seen a lot of shit and Mm. nothing really phases him but at the same time i don't think he's so jaded as to be a um you know like a corrupt cop or someone who doesn't care i think he's still got that sort of fire to serve justice as he sees it as a cop so I, I really like him. Yeah, I like him too. And uh, yeah, and, and like you said, we did mention that he did have the sty for his, um, you know, for his eye patch, but that's not explained in the episode. That was deleted. And uh, yeah, so obviously, yeah, it would affected him so much he had to wear an eye patch. And Kramer got inspired to wear one himself. Yeah, so he's uh, he's not only sort of a, a jaded you know, no nonsense cop. He's also a uh, trendsetter. A <laughs> trendsetter, that's it. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I liked Officer Morgan, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he would have been relishing the fact that Newman finally got caught. Uh, even though he wasn't directly involved, I'm sure he would have found out eventually, and he would have felt very, very satisfied. He probably retired then and there. As soon as he was done, he was like, my life's work's done. I've caught the yeah. I've caught the scoff floor. <laughs> I can retire <laughs> on my it. pension now. Yeah, it's the same as us getting a shout out from um from uh, Larry. You know. Yeah, he's, an he's indirect uh, one more, from Larry Thomas. Yeah. No more work to be done. Let's. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Let's pack it up. We're done. Yeah. So Officer Morgan, yeah, he was happy. He finally got what he wanted, which is good. It was kind of like a feel-good story for him. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we couldn't <laughs> see uh, his satisfaction, we uh, we would, I think we safely assume that he got it. All right. Uh, do you have anything else about him? No, but let's talk about Debbie. Uh, she's played by Barbara Allen Woods. She's been on the TV show One Tree Hill and in the film Strip Tease. And uh, we mentioned that she is a childhood friend of George and Gary's. And um, she was, I feel like she was gaslit by Gary. Uh, and uh, she loves Gary for his supposed a battle with cancer. Yeah, definitely another unfortunate victim of Gary's grift. And I think it would be quite damaging. You know, she would have soon found out, I think, after the episode aired, you know, that Gary was lying. And I think it would have taken an emotional toll because, I mean, when you when you give your heart to someone and you find out that that person is not who they say they are or the, the conditions in which you, you know, decided to fall in love with them were completely made up I think that would be very damaging and I'm sure that that would have a lasting effect on her yeah yeah definitely yeah. and uh, yeah, I feel like she's probably looking for love as well so she probably yeah she probably just feels like you know I finally found someone who I might be interested in and you know turns out it's a lie yeah and I think that would um you know make her maybe fearful of of giving her heart out for a while after that you know it'll take a little while to get over I do like how she's very adamant that uh she gave uh, George her regards but didn't say hi <laughs> yeah but that's what you do for someone who you don't really you know associate too much with you just say I'll oh, give my regards you know someone who's more like an acquaintance yeah it's it's very um, impersonal it's whereas a impersonal, high you know, yes. tell a third party hi from me is, is a bit more personal and direct it has a bit more of an intention but yeah I just loved how firm she was she's like no 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 I didn't say hi I you know I gave <laughs> you I told our Gary to give you my regards and just how disappointed George is because uh, you know she's curious <laughs> she's like what, what made you call me and George you know he thinks it's a date or it's like a, a you know an opportunity to to rekindle what they had but uh she's she's not into it you know because her heart is with gary that's right and george once again got grifted by gary <laughs> he did <Yeah. laughs> he did again 
Oh, and then the car park at the end. Ways, yeah. Exactly, the car park and then Debbie and, and obviously yep. George always had a thing for Debbie in school and or whatever. And, uh, yeah, he thought this was his chance. That's it. Yep. Yeah, I felt sorry for Deb. I think um, she, uh, you know, she's she's someone who, like you said, she's looking for, you know, for love and companionship, something a bit more serious and mature uh, in her life. And she made a decision to give it to a friend, um, you know, because it's not like she just met Gary. You know, they were lifelong friends. So it didn't just cost her her heart. I think it would have cost, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of years of friendship as well. So big, uh, big toll. Uh, Massive. Taking on people. Yeah, it sounds like a romantic comedy, eh? You know, one guy fakes cancer and then the woman who, you know, is the other guy who's showing unrequited love to the lady, you know, she falls in love with the, the lying guy. It sounds like a romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah, I can see it working in a in a rom com script for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but poor Debbie. She, hopefully, she uh, did find love. She won't be giving her regards or saying hi to anyone for a while. I think. No, probably not for a while. <laughs> not for a while. You, not for a while. Do you have any other notes on Debbie? Uh, no, but uh, I do have a couple of notes on the salesman. Uh, he's the one who's trying to sell George the toupee um, yes. at the hair clinic. That's right. Yes. So what did you got? Uh, so he, I think, is he reminded me of just your sort of stereotypical classic nerd. Um, he's very sort of he's a bit awkward and he has the Coke bottle glasses. Uh, and I think he's just, you know, maybe growing up uh, in his life, he was just sort of bullied a lot, mm. you know, because he's very, very defensive and protective of toupees. And he obviously doesn't like it when people mock toupees or mock people who wear toupees. You know, he's very aggressive towards Jerry, you know, rightly so. I mean, Jerry's being pretty mean in the situation. He um, is, isn't he? And he's actually, yeah. for, for a very rare occasion, you actually see Jerry having like a verbal argument with someone besides mm. one of the core four. So I found that really interesting how Jerry becomes all, like on the attack as well. Yeah, yeah. Jerry stands up for, um, you know, sometimes he gets on a bit of a rant and he stands up for what he thinks is the right thing but it's rarely on behalf of someone he's sort of standing up for even though he's doing it you know maybe not in the best way he he thinks he's acting on george's behalf for his best interests um but yeah he gets very um yeah very sort of argumentative with with the salesman which is like you said which is rare for jerry yeah i just think he i hate to describe him like that but he just gave me like unfortunate nerd geek dork whatever Mm. word you want to use vibes you know he's probably bullied in high school probably a bit of a loner Probably a bit yeah. of a geek. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the the toupee maybe helped him move on from that a bit and give him a bit more confidence. And that's why he's very, very protective uh, of uh, Jerry's, well, you know, towards Jerry's attack. Do you think it's his shop? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he's just, I mean, he might be an experienced salesman in the, in the shop, but I don't think it's his clinic. Yeah. I think because he's credited as salesman rather than, you know, store owner. Oh, true. Clinic yeah, yeah. Clinic, <laughs> clinic manager or something. I'm just going on that. He just gets a commission and, and his salary and that's it and he goes home. Yeah. <laughs> I think he'd be a pretty successful, you know, salesman. I mean, he he obviously has a bit of rapport with Gary because, you know, Gary just sort of waltzes on in confidently and he's like, hey, you know, I've got a, mm. I need a new fitting. Like, I think he's good at what he does, you know, and he yeah, really, yeah. Um, establishes rapport and, and, and um, trust with his clients because, you know, he's, he's, he's not only there. Uh, to pay salesman i think he acts almost as like a bit of a therapist for men who maybe feel a bit insecure about their baldness no there you go so he's like a pseudo counselor too yeah yeah i don't i don't think it's too deep but i think he is a bit of a confidant it's probably the best way to put it yeah i'm sure gary you know but gary probably still has the lie about having cancer he probably you know lies about the cancer to the salesman as well yeah yep yeah sure, I Just, he'll never he'll never admit it He'll never admit no, the truth. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> Do you have no. any notes about any of the other secondaries? Uh, just the guy with the glasses. Uh, he's played by producer and writer Danny Breen. He's known for the Wayne Brady show and the film The Net, starring the woman from the bus. <laughs> like Frank Costanza says, the woman from the bus, that's it. I watched that film, The Net, that woman from the bus. <laughs> So good. Um, But anyway, the guy with the glasses, I found him really intriguing because he's simply like when Elaine says, can I buy the glasses off you? He actually sells them to her. Yeah, I think he uh, he realizes that Elaine seems quite keen. So I think he's just like, well, you know, maybe he goes to Malaysia regularly. Uh, mm, or you know, yeah. regular enough, regular enough to you know to think. Well, you know, I'll, I'll be back there in three or six or twelve months, so I'll just you know, I'll get. I don't know how much did Elaine pay for them. I'm going to say like five hundred bucks or something. Probably um, at least, yeah, yeah, because the implication is that they're expensive and that she would have paid more than what they cost him just to get them to show up, Jake. So yeah, I, I think if he if he never had the opportunity to get them again, he wouldn't have sold them for anything because initially he was very reluctant. But when Elaine's you know sort of says. 
well, name your price, basically, let's start the bidding. I think he realizes, well, I'll be disappointed that I don't have them for a period of time, but I'm going back to Malaysia in six months or whatever. So I'll just wait. Yeah. And so he just gives him to Elaine. But I, I found him to be a bit absent minded as well. Like you think mm. he'd have like a spare pair of glasses. He just wanders across the street or tries to cross the street and he can't see shit. <laughs> and, you know, he nearly gets hit by George. So you think he'd be a bit more uh, forward thinking. I don't know. Maybe he's desperate for cash. You know, maybe he's got some some debts to settle or some bills to pay or something. And A loan well. shark. He owes money to a loan shark or something. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, the Malaysian underworld or something. You know, gambling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. That's probably why you know, he goes back to Malaysia to get his, uh, you know, his betting fix and uh, to get yeah. his glasses. Maybe maybe he lives in Malaysia and he's come to New York to, uh, to escape from the Malaysian underworld. And now he's like, well, now he's, you know, loaded up with cash. You can go back and pay him back and, you know, resume his gambling or whatever he does. <laughs> Just get into bigger, bigger holes of debt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that, but yeah, I just found him. I, I just found it really interesting how he just simply sells Elaine the glasses, but he doesn't have a spare one to walk across the street. I guess that kind of adds to the the story. But yeah, I just found that really yeah. weird. Like, why would he do yeah. that? You know, yeah. there's got to be a reason behind it. Yeah, I, I would assume that he's, uh, you know, he, he needs cash more than eyesight in that moment. Yeah, weird. <laughs> okay, I just found it really odd. Yeah, no, I, uh, I I agree. I think that's all the secondary characters from this week. Quite a few to go through, but uh, fun nonetheless. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a break, and when we come back, we will talk about whether any of the secondary characters appear in our top 10 and where the scoff law appears in order of the episodes we've reviewed so far. In 1979, I ticketed a brown Dodge diplomat for parking in a church zone. That fine was never paid. And since then, that scoff law has piled up more parking tickets than anyone in New York City. For 16 years, I pursued him, only to see him give me the slip time and time again. I've never got a clean look at his face, but he's become my white whale. <laughs> Mr. Kramer, that day was yesterday, but thanks to you, I don't know if I'll ever get that chance again. So, Stephen, out of 135 episodes of Seinfeld we have talked about the secondary characters for, where does the scoff law sit for you? Uh, it sits at number 126. Okay, so pretty low. Yeah, for me, it's 119. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I told you at the start of the episode, I found it to be like clunky and I don't know, it just felt like it felt like a seat, like a later season episode of Seinfeld. But at least with some or most of the episodes from those seasons, actually, like they're clunky, but they kind of work most of the time. But I felt like they were just the writers were just throwing ideas in and seeing what sticks. Yeah, it did seem like a bit of a, a hodgepodge. Um, I thought some things really worked. I, I love the idea of George getting a toupee and it, uh, you know, boosting his confidence, you know, and that happens uh, more than once. But yeah, some things worked, but I think most of it was pretty average. And we see Elaine throw the toupee out of the window in a later episode, which yeah. is always funny. I don't yeah. like this. And here's what I'm going to do with it now. <laughs> <Not the best laughs> of yes, yes. But yeah, no, very, uh, very forgettable episode in, in most parts. And yeah, it, it's not one that really comes up usually. But I did like Gary Fogel. I thought he was a good character. I mean, he was a, a, sh a shitty personality uh, character, but I really love John Lovitz's performance. Yeah, I agree there. Does Gary, is he in your top 20 at all or any other characters no, from today? No, no look, I, I think... Um... He's a memorable character because he's such mm. a scumbag, but yes. he uh, is, I do like grumpy old men, you know, negative people, but not bad people. So no. nowhere near my top 20. What about you? Yeah, uh, no, no, but you don't like bad 30 to 40 year old men at the time <laughs> or, yeah. or middle age. He's not quite old. <laughs> he's not quite yeah. a grumpy old man. Um, but no. yeah, no, he's just, a, he's just a real scumbag. But I know I did, I did like his, uh, John's performance though. But yeah, yeah, but the other secondary characters, yeah, I mean, they, they were all right. I mean, I liked Officer Morgan too, but yeah, not yeah, enough no. to make my 20. Yeah, no, same. Officer Morgan was good, but um, yeah, not, not enough to be on the list. That's it for another week of, but I don't want to be a secondary character. Uh, what are we doing next week? Next week, we're going to season seven and we are talking about the caddy with stan the caddy and jackie charles makes an appearance and this is the episode with sue ellen mishki with her bra top so i guess we can talk a bit about her in the context of the episode because we have done a special what's the deal with episode on sue ellen uh which you can go back and listen to but uh yeah we can talk more about them and uh, the other secondary characters indeed in the meantime if you do want to get in touch with us we have an email address we're on social media uh you can check out those details in the show notes below uh, and uh, we uh, have a Patreon and a PayPal if you want to give us a few bucks and help us out. And finally, if you want to check out our Seinfeld group, type Seinfeldisms into Facebook uh, and join the biggest Seinfeld group on Facebook. Yes, very exciting. And my name's Ivan. And I'm Stephen. We'll catch you next week for the caddy. You stay safe and take care of each other. Goodbye. Goodbye.